Hello, and welcome to EPR with your favorite environmental nerds, Nick and Laura. On today's episode, we give our shout outs. Nick and I discussed imposter syndrome. We have a wonderful conversation with Dr. Tracy Fenera about her work at NOAA, public speaking, and the awesomeness of science, which I think we all agree. Mm -hmm. We covered everything in this one episode, (laughs) and so the description does not do it justice. She's amazing and does so many things, so many cool, interesting projects. You have to check out the rest of this interview. And finally, before it was known to cause cancer, radium was considered to have mystical healing properties and was used in a wide range of products, including chocolate, water, suppositories, and amazingly as a cure for impotence. (laughs) You could see me scratching my head right now. I don't know Uh, what to say about that one. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I don't want to think about that. That's pretty much the worst thing you could do, I think, is... (laughs) I'm some really glad we live in the modern age of medicine, but who knows yeah, what yeah. they'll be saying 50 years from now about That's what, what I was doing. thinking. <laughs> That's exactly it. Like, what are we doing now? Are they, like, they're going to look back 50 years and be like, can you believe these idiots <laughs> thought this was a good idea? <laughs> Microblading comes to mind. Oh, anyway, yeah. please be sure to subscribe, <laughs> rate, and review. Hit that music. Our shout out today goes to a longtime listener and one of our very first supporters, Susan Gerlach. Susan's support of the show behind the scenes has been just awesome. So we wanted to take the time to say thank you so much for listening. Um, It's really, really great to hear good feedback or just regular feedback, you know. But yeah, thank you so much and really, really happy to have you listening. So also, everyone, don't forget to check out NAEP's Environmental Professionals Connection, which is an environmental hub for articles, research studies, and leadership blogs from hundreds of leading sources. Check it out at environmentalprofessionalsconnection.com. Nick and I love doing this show. If you love it too and would like to see us keep doing it, we need your help. We can't do it without our awesome sponsors. So if you're interested in sponsoring, please head over to www.environmentalprofessionalsradio.com and check out the sponsor form for more details. Let's get to our segment. Cool. So, you know, you're our environmental career coach. And I have a question for you, which is, you know, kind of the opposite of how we do this. But um, I was thinking about this the other day, you know, like, like gaining responsibility. You know, when you're gaining responsibility early in your career, I think a lot of people, at least in my experience, my thoughts is, what do they call it? Imposter syndrome, where you don't think you are capable of doing this because you haven't done that job, but you have mm-hmm. all of the skills and the requirements and the energy to do so. So how do we get over that hump? How do we get over that nausea, that fear, that self-doubt when we're we're given a new chance to do something we haven't done before? That's, you know, a promotion, basically. Yeah. Well, first and foremost, you say yes. (laughs) So always like we've talked about on here before, if there are opportunities to volunteer, to do something new, to try something, uh, you say yes. And then if you don't know how to do it, what it is, not sure you understand it, then you start asking questions, <laughs> you know, and then you yeah. go get answers to those questions. So you can right. either go on Google, the magic machine that will tell you anything and everything you want to know. Right. Right. Um, yeah. You know, so how do I give a presentation? How do I like I need to make a media kit all of a sudden? So like I'm not just pulling that yeah. out of my butt. I'm like, yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna go online and I'm gonna Google how do I do this? And there's yeah. hundreds of people who will tell me if you've got to go out water sampling or something or use equipment you haven't used before. You can right. go watch tutorials and you can, you know, ask somebody who's, you know, find a professional. This goes back to having a network of people. You know, mm-hmm. if you have a mentor, then you could ask your mentor. Right. You know, if Nick is your is your mentor, <laughs> you know, you can call up Nick or you call up me. Yeah. You could ask us questions. Um, don't call me. Email me. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> and then you get an email things. back saying I'm busy. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm right. kidding. Um, <laughs> um yeah. So, you know, and, and you know, that's, that's standard stuff. That's good. I think that's, that's good advice. And it's just, uh, but like, have you seen that? You want something else? Seen... What else do you no, want? No, no, no. I want to kind of <laughs> expand on it. I, have you seen that self-doubt a lot? Because it's what, it's oh, what yeah. you do, right? Yeah. I see it when people are writing their resumes and their cover letters. I mean, they're like, <laughs> can I, is this okay if I say this? Like, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, you've got to put yourself out there. It's all about putting yourself out there. You know, you have to be, believe in yourself first. 
Like right. I can do this. Think of all the things that you've already done. You know, mm -hmm. if you have graduated with some sort of environmental degree, that's a huge accomplishment. Yeah. You know, or any degree for that matter. Um, yeah. But there's a lot of stuff that you've already done in your life that you can, you know, give yourself credit for. Right. And there will be lots more things that you're going to do. And it never right. stops. You know, it's that's not true. like you never get to a point where you're like, okay, I know everything I need to know about this. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Or if you I do, think, you know, I don't want you on my team. <laughs> right. No, I know. I, I think it's absolutely a great statement. Like everybody thinks you just stop learning when you're young. You're like, yeah. they just know so much. It's like they don't know everything. And they know yeah. so much because they've been doing this a long time. It's yeah. a really good point. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I just, you just have to put yourself out there. And then, like I said, have mentors, check in with people, get feedback afterwards. I mean, the worst thing you can do is the only failure is not doing your best. So if you have yeah. researched, you have tried, you've practiced and something goes wrong, you did your best. That's not failure, but get feedback. After you do something, ask somebody so the next time would be better. And that's yeah. that's a win too, you know? Yeah. But ask people that matter. Don't right. ask. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> don't ask the wrong people. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, don't ask your best friend. You got to ask <laughs> your professionals. You know, is I think there's that self-sabotage as well comes into play. Sometimes, oh, yeah. You know, where people are like, well, I don't know what I'm doing, so I won't give my all. And then if it goes poorly, then I can blame the fact that I didn't give it my all. Yeah. And uh, if it goes well, then I'm screwed because I don't like the thing that I'm doing because I didn't give it my all and I'm good at it. And I think that that's part of the kind of can, can get missed. But it's the reason you should. If you're not interested and invested in something, like don't go after it. There are things you can say no to as well. But new career challenges, I think they're fantastic. I love that. Being able to do something new for me is very, very exciting. And I don't know uh, if you feel the same way, but I love being challenged. You know, when you get kind of complacent, that's that's the hard part, you know, for me. So it's like, I, you know, I have to balance that with like, okay, you can't get challenged every day, Nick. Sometimes you just have to do your job, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Well, and I think too, the thing that, that is a myth or is miss advertised by some coaches and things is like, you don't get rid of imposter syndrome. You can't make it go away 100%. It is a fact. It's a phenomenon. It's one of the reasons why we advance as humans. It keeps us wanting to do better and to perform better. Yeah. So you don't like, just like, you know, if you never stop learning. You're never going to stop feeling a little bit of like, am I in the right place? Should I be right, here? Am I right, good enough right. to be here? Especially if you're around other high performing people, you're going to be like, am I qualified to be in the room with these people? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, oh my God. And that's not a bad thing. So I think right. I honestly think people need to stop thinking of imposter syndrome as this like horrible, debilitating thing. Right. It is a motivating factor. And, you know, your job should be to put imposter syndrome in its place. And like, just <laughs> own it. Like, yeah. yeah, exactly. Like, okay, why yeah, am I yeah. feeling this way? I'm feeling this way because I'm surrounded by awesome people and I'm awesome too, you know? Right, right. Yeah. Or I'm going to learn from these awesome people and one day I will be awesome. Will be awesome. Also. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like, gosh, there was a, there was a moment um, a few months ago where someone was asking me a NEPA related question. And I didn't have to think about it. I was just like, oh, yeah, that's this, that, the other, you know, here's Nipa, 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 Nipa. And it just came out of my mouth. And I'm like, I know stuff. And it, <laughs> like, I've been doing this for like 12 years. Of course I know stuff. Of course I do. But like, it just like, it hit me like, oh, I'm the expert now, you know? And it's not like I know everything. Again, you know, I, I have a long way to go. But I was like, oh, yeah, I know what the hell I'm talking about. Probably more than most people. <laughs> like, yeah, <laughs> you know? Yeah. But you can say that imposter syndrome, which I guess we should say is where you you have the abilities, but you don't actually believe in yourself. You think that you don't, like you just said, like you had just outlined, but like that little imposter was there. And then I, I saw like, no, I actually do know what the hell I'm talking about. Right. That was right. Put Look it at in me. place. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Get out of here, kid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Got work to do. <laughs> so, yeah. Cool. Well, that's really good. Thank you for the perspective on that. It's uh, I, I've been meaning to ask you for a couple of weeks, so. Glad we got it in. Yeah, great. Let's get to our <laughs> interview. Welcome back to EPR. Today we have Dr. Tracy Finara. She's an environmental engineer, scientist, investigator, public speaker, and a Marvel comic agent of Girl, G-I-R-L. And it is so exciting to have you here on the show. 
And um, that's right. I did say Marvel Comics. So <laughs> science is cool now in case you missed that memo. <laughs> so <laughs> welcome, Tracy. Thank you so much for having me. I'm honored to be here. Awesome. So we have so many questions to ask you. You have so many cool things going on. I'm not really even sure where to start. So maybe you could just first tell us where you're from and how you get started in environmental science and engineering. Sure. I'm from Buffalo, New York. And if you know anything about Buffalo, New York, you know that it's one of the most polluted cities in America. And so in, in fourth grade, my teacher told me about a hazardous waste dump site that was right down the street from me that industries had been dumping toxins into canal ways that were leaching into soils and groundwater. And people started building houses and schools and there were birth defects and cancer clusters. And for me, I realized that everything in this world is connected. What we put into the environment eventually comes back to impact us. And that was, it happened before I was born. Uh, the incident was called Love Canal and it started the EPA Superfund program. And oh, so yeah, that's yeah. kind of, that, yeah, that's kind of the first, the first thing that I learned that started me on my journey. And so since then, you've gotten your PhD. How did you decide what you were going to work on and where you were going to school and stuff? Yeah, it was a lot that happened in between those two. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. So yeah. I, I actually went to Hobart because I, all I wanted to do was play lacrosse. I yeah. just wanted to play sports. And it was the most beautiful campus I had ever seen. Right. It was 1,200 students. It was like <laughs> a little bigger than my high school. Right, um, right, right. <laughs> so I was going to the field house every day through the snow, uphill both ways. True story. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And my parents had moved to Florida and every single day they were leaving messages on our answer. It's beautiful. It's 80 degrees. (laughs) And one day I was just like, I'm done. Like I just applied to UF. I even forgot about it. And I was uh, a camp counselor over the next summer for a boys camp in Maine. And my mom called me and she's like, oh, by the way, you didn't get into UF. And I was like, Uh what? (laughs) So I took my transcripts yeah. and went down to the University of Florida and knocked on every door until until I found someone. And and it happened to be environmental engineering. And I had never heard of environmental engineering before. Oh, wow. And yeah. yeah, so they told me that environmental engineers are the people that protect people from natural disasters and clean water and make sure there's enough food and clean air and build things and design things. And I was like, I, I want to be a superhero. Uh, yeah. So that's, that's how awesome. I became an environmental engineer. He let me in right then and there. UF actually rejected me three times in which I got all three degrees. <laughs> that's amazing. Not, that's no amazing. joke. It's hilarious. Yeah. But you first appeared. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. You know, that kind of, you know, and maybe this is going to roll right into our next question because I know like creating content is daunting and it can be really intense. And you've done a lot of it. You've developed an initiative known as Inspector Planet. And before you tell us about it, I am dying to know if this is a combination of Inspector Gadget and Captain Planet, because that's the first thing I thought of. Is that what it it absolutely is? It absolutely is. (laughs) Because of entropy, we can never have true sustainability. And the only reason, the only way we're going to get to achieving anything close is through innovation. And so those two things combined is Inspector Inspector Planet. Planet. Nice, nice work on that. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I mean, I was going through my PhD and people were, my friends were throwing trash out their car windows and, oh. and I was asking them where, that, where they thought it went. And they either didn't know or thought it went to a wastewater treatment plant when in fact, every single drop of rain that lands on the state of Florida goes to a natural water body. Right. And I realized that their behaviors changed upon yeah. telling them that. Really? So, That's great. Yeah, yeah. So there's power in education and communication. And that's when I started making content. Yeah. And so awesome. so tell us a little bit more about Inspector Planet. Like what's the goal of the of the, the initiative? You know, it's an ever evolving mission that ends up coming back to exactly where it started. Really my goal is not only to educate, communicate and just allow for a place for people from all walks of life to come and, you know, just be part of an environmental mission, but also I want to solve real problems and get yeah. to them before the media does. My last position at Moat Marine Laboratory really highlighted the importance of that because misinformation, miscommunication during an environmental crisis can run rampant. Yes. And something like a mobile lab where citizens are actually involved in collecting samples and the analysis is the best way to really educate the general public and to increase that environmental literacy 
in scientific literacy. Yeah, I mean, that's a great, great point. And, you know, I think we've seen that quite a bit talking about all of the misinformation that can come out. So is that that is the way you found is the best way to connect with people is going out into communities and getting them involved? Oh, absolutely. You know, during the Florida water crisis in 2018, I was I was one of the very few experts and the only one that was actually putting myself on social media and out in public. And I learned so much. It was the hardest time of my career, but it was definitely the point in my career where I had the most growth, not only communication wise, but also just understanding people. And the most important thing is to have empathy and to listen. And it's so hard at first because you're like, yes. you're wrong. And that never <laughs> right, works. right. That never right. works. So like you're paid off. Yeah. You know, so it really is an art and I haven't mastered it. I haven't, but I'm getting closer. Yeah. And it's a really great point. I mean, nobody likes hearing being told they're wrong. Nobody does. Nobody. nobody is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no one person. Especially if they're passionate about that incorrect information. Because with the Florida water crisis, we had a dual toxic algae bloom. So these are phytoplankton yeah. species and a cyanobacteria that was releasing a toxin. The one in our marine environment is called Florida red tide. And that toxin is released into the air. So it affects people by breathing it in, coughing, sneezing, or if they eat shellfish infected with it, they can get very, very sick. So it was a very serious thing. And everybody just wanted to point to one thing because if they can point to one thing, right, right. they could fix it. Right. Uh, and, and I get that, but it's never one it's never thing. One thing. Yeah. And it's, there's always something that each individual can do. So if you're pointing the finger at someone else, very, very unlikely that you're going to look in the mirror. Exactly. Awesome. So, you know, you talked about Buffalo and some of the, the stories that your teacher was telling you. And obviously you cared about the environment even at a young age. And now moving to Florida, you see how much water. I mean, for me growing up in Florida, I actually, until I got my biology degree, didn't understand myself how it was all connected and, and how important it is to diversity and wildlife and, and our own existence. At what point during your education or just your own personal experiences to the water? Because I know a lot of people who are environmental engineers who are scientists and they don't all go all in as far as you are. So You're right. <laughs> where does this passion and drive come from to put you yourself out there on one. social media when no one else yeah. is doing that and, yeah. you know, make this, you know, a crusade for you? You know, everything that you just said is so correct. And you having a biology degree probably allows you to see it because it's not, and not all scientists and engineers are equally passionate about what they do. Right. Yeah. For me, it's two things. First of all, you know, coming down to Florida, my first job was in civil engineering before I went to grad school. And I saw how we were mismanaging our land. And I realized that telling our clients, our land developers, that there's a cheaper way that they could be more environmentally friendly, which you can't tell them that. I learned that one because they <laughs> automatically associate right. sustainability with cost. Right. Yes. yes. Yeah. So I was like, hey, I can save you time and money. They're like, no, nah, no thanks. I know exactly how much it's going to cost and how long it's going to take. So I'm going to do it the way it's always been done and look at our problems now. But really what that drove me to go to grad school and prove that there was a better way. And I did and, and nothing changed. I'm still working on it because obviously people are going to start listening because of all of our problems and right. yeah. low impact development retrofit can help a lot of it. But, you know, from my high school, seven people have already been diagnosed with cancer. Oh, wow. And yeah, in Williamsville, Williamsville, New York, is which is a suburb outside of Buffalo. Mm -hmm. Right. People don't even know. They don't even know that there was a nuclear waste facility, that it was part of the Manhattan Project, that there are so, so many, there have been 100 super fun sites in Buffalo, like th really, really think about that. The whole state yeah. of Ohio, I think, has had has had like thirty four. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. Like really. Yeah. And and it's just people don't want to know this stuff, so it's almost like I feel the responsibility to fight for the people that refuse to fight for themselves. Yeah. No, that's and so I think that that's where some of it comes from. Nice. Well, kudos to you for doing that. And then, so back on the algal bloom front, um, I did work on some of that. And uh, when I was still in Tampa. So oh, cool. <laughs> what do you yeah. see is sort of like, how can we do more to address it? Or is that something that you're working on? Yeah, I mean, 
you know, we get over millennia, we've gotten 70% of our oxygen from phytoplankton. Phytoplankton right. is essential for yeah. our ecosystem. But just few species are toxic. And with climate change and with our manipulation of the water cycle and land development and all of that, we are increasing the frequency and intensity of these cyanobacteria, which are these freshwater species. One of the most notable toxic species is called microcystis. Mm-hmm. And that shut down Toledo's water system years ago. And that's what in Florida right now, we, we use groundwater mostly right. as our drinking water source. But still, this microcystis has been linked, or microcystin, the toxin, has been linked to ALS and Parkinson's. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. So, I mean, it is, it's in people's backyards and it affects all income bases. No one can really get away from it. You think that you're coming down to Florida, living on the water, and it's going to be amazing. And then you're plagued with this kind of thing. And, and Florida Red Tide, you know, we get a bloom every year. These blooms start offshore yeah. at the ocean bottom. They're slow growers. So they're all competed closer to shore, but their power is in numbers. Um, yeah. And so when there is a bloom and it does move closer to shore, that's when humans can play a role. Our surface water nutrients coming in, our wastewater overflows. So many people don't realize that throughout the in- entire United States coastline, building on the coastline, we get something called infiltration and inundation, yeah. which allows for stormwater to enter sewage pipes, go back into the sewage facility that doesn't have the capacity to handle that. And there's mandated sewage, raw sewage outflows. This happens in Florida a lot because we get a lot of rain. Yeah. So low impact development retrofit, changing our activities, you know, the amount of fertilizer that people use on their lawn, the, the fact that we have lawns at all. I mean, seriously, it's the number one agriculture product worldwide that produces nothing. Right. Absolutely. But great grass. Amazing right. grass. <laughs> right. Nice. Nice. I mean, we have prettier species in Florida, but, you know. Yeah. 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 Homeowners associations, ju- are, <laughs> they just want it to look like it's Connecticut. Right. Yeah. Everywhere, which is crazy. And, uh, mm-hmm. and, it, and it's wild. I think the, um, the dynamic across the country with water is very different. You know, like where we are on the East Coast, it rains a ton. You know, we've talked before about how little it rains out West and how challenging it is for them. And it's, uh, it's almost like uh, two different universes, you know, they deal with water in a completely different way than we do. But how close are we to actually getting to a place where we can actually combat these issues? Because I feel like sometimes it feels like we're so far away that we'll never get there. Yeah, I think the science is there. I think the science is there. I mean, yeah. you know, mimicking the natural water cycle and engineering design to allow for that and allow us to live on the land and make it look hydrologically that like nothing is built on top of it. It's there. That's what I did for my dissertation. Yeah. Um, advances in water treatment are there. Yeah. It's just mandating, changing the way we do things, mandating and fixing what is seemingly not broken, putting money into solving a problem by changing things that work just fine. And that's the hard part, right? Because right, we, yeah. we don't have unlimited funds. Right. So to go back to an urban environment and retrofit a city like Philadelphia did with their Philadelphia Green Streets project is kind of expensive, but not, not as expensive as one might think, actually. And it does improve the aesthetics. But we have a bigger challenge than Philadelphia does because of our water table. You know, yeah. we don't have as much room to infiltrate, but still we have the engineering designs to do that. Right now, Mount Marine Laboratory is working on ways to mitigate these blooms out in the ocean. Before I left and went to NOAA, I had four or five projects that were funded under that and they were really cool, really cool. But but these blooms are going to happen no matter what. It's really what we're doing on our land that we have immediate control over. And with cyanobacteria blooms, I mean, same thing. What are we going to do? Keep on putting band-aids? Right. over problems and just right. let the problems keep on growing yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. apparently that answer is yes we've been doing it for 100 years right it, yeah it's exactly right it's like putting a band-aid when your arm's off you know it's like the, the problem is you don't have an arm anymore right, right. <laughs> you know? right. yeah <laughs> and it's yeah it's amazing so i mean i i think there's, there's really great projects i hope we can get closer to that solution but uh i love that you mentioned noah so you're a coastal modeling manager there so what are you doing with noah 
right now? What are you working on? Yeah, so this is a perfect segue from algae bloom. So we had been studying, Marine Laboratory and others had been studying photoread tide for like 70 years. Mm-hmm. And we still had so many answers about initiation, about dissipation, about life cycle. And a lot of that is because we're looking at a microscopic organism in a huge body of water that acts differently in a laboratory than it does in the natural environment. So getting yeah. answers has been very difficult. But then I started to you know, do my own research, really look into things and look into research that NASA has done on these blooms and seeing that hurricanes can play a role and has played a role in these yeah. really big blooms, like yeah. 2004, five and six. That was a yeah. huge bloom. We had four hurricanes proceeding. 2017 and 19, the most recent really big red tide bloom, we had a hurricane Irma. And yeah. then this recent bloom, you know, you heard about that in Tampa Bay, probably that bloom initiated about two weeks after Hurricane Ada came through the West Coast of Florida. And then we had this big phosphate mine release into Tampa Bay, which is very controversial and very yeah. environmentally hazardous. But we saw the currents bringing the bloom up north. And then, you know, we started getting cell counts in Tampa Bay, which is, I wouldn't say rare, but we haven't had a really bad bloom in Tampa Bay since the 1970s. And then we had Hurricane Elsa come through and bring all of those patchy blooms up, dead fish. And then basically it started to feed itself. Yes, exactly. Um, Yeah. Yeah. So hurricanes have played a role. Saharan dust coming over from Africa feeds... Yes, feeds the Amazon, but also feeds another species of marine cyanobacteria called trichodesmium that dies and then feeds Florida red tide offshore. Huh. Okay, so we have blue holes. We have we have these caves and caverns that come up basically like sinkholes 50 miles offshore of Florida. And my friends are finding that there's possibly nutrient fluxes from land nutrients in 50 miles offshore where it's expected that these blooms initiate. And then we have some scientists are hypothesizing that 40% of the U.S. that drains into the Mississippi Atchafalaya watershed. Yeah. yeah. That causing the second largest dead zone in the world. Right, right. Might play a role. So basically, we have no local phenomena. There are no local problems. It's all This is an earth system phenomena. And so when I had the opportunity to apply for this position to look at earth system phenomena, to answer these questions, I took it. Yeah. Wow. That's awesome. That's incredible. It's a really long story to say. No, I no, <laughs> no. It's great. It's great. I just like, I'm, I'm stunned. I'm thinking about, you know, Sahara. I, I knew the Sahara fed the Amazon. I didn't know that, but I didn't know it was coming up here messing with our algae. That's crazy. That's wild yeah, to hear. It is, you know? right? Yeah. It's, it's my favorite, everything is connected example. Right. And, you know, it's, Dead zones are an economic thing, right? Like, I feel like that's the easy thing to say. Well, you know, we've got dead zones. We should fix the dead zone because it costs money. It costs us right. money. But how do you convince a farmer in Iowa to care about exactly. a shellfish farm in Louisiana? Exactly. Yep. And that's the challenge. Yeah. So even bigger than that. Um, <laughs> so I have a call, colleague named Megan Andrews, and she's she's working towards getting into work at that intersection of space and environment. And that's, I think, how I came across you, which is funny because you're in Tampa. Um, and she's not. So <laughs> anyway, but she had she had liked a post that you made about how you were just had just learned that you were one of the finalists for the SpaceX challenge. So what is that? How did you what did you submit? And what's that all about? Yeah. So for years, I, w- I was probably one of those people saying, why are we putting money into space research when we have so many problems on Earth? Right. Well, and that was before I started actually doing space research. NASA approached me. Well, it it was actually initiated by an intern, that relationship. They wanted to put aquaponics in space. And so I started working with the PI over there, Luke Robertson. And he started telling me, well, this project was first inspired by unsafe drinking water in third world countries, which is a big, big, like, passion of mine. Um, unsafe drinking water. And then he's like, and I want to fix the problems in the Indian River Lagoon, which is a river in Florida, which has undergone such ecosystem changes that we have experienced a mass manatee mortality event, one like never before. I think we've lost over 900 manatees this year in that area. Oh oh my God. Um, Right. And I was like, 
wait a second, you know, like, so you're trying to do this and it's actually, you know, your goal is actually to solve these problems on earth. And he was like, yeah. And I was like, so we're using space money for earth problems. And I was like, this is amazing. We're literally breaking the boundaries of sustainability that we don't have to reach right now, but we should be. Yeah. And so that's what got me involved in space at all. And then from there, I saw my friend, Kevin J. Bruin put on his social media that he applied for this. It's called Dear Moon. And it's a billionaire from Japan. And he is basically funding a SpaceX trip around the moon. With eight individuals, he wanted them to be artists from around the world. Wow. And so, I mean, I, science is an art, but I use art and science in everything that I do from yep. sustainable design and my comic book that I co-produce and, you know, rapping about science and social media and videos and TV stuff, <laughs> all that stuff. Stop <laughs> being so cool. Uh, no, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, that, I'm not, no. No, no. no. Uh, That's fantastic. So how many teams, like, uh, was it a team or did you apply individually or... Yeah, I implied individually. Um, And I was shocked. So I thought that everybody was asked to go to the video stage, but that was not the case. Yeah. But I still knew that there was hundreds of thousands of people that got to that point. So I'm like, do I even, you know, we were undergoing a change in administration, of course, Mm -hmm. with the United States. And we had a lot of budget requests and new mandates and executive orders, everything that we were... We were working on it. Was a, it was a little bit much. So I wasn't even going to submit my video because I thought I had no chance. But last minute, I put together something and it was at night, like mm-hmm. everybody was sleeping. And so I had to put together pieces of things that I already had. Right. And it was not my best showing whatsoever. And I really wish I could do it over. But <laughs> apparently it was enough to get to the yeah. next stage. And, it's and it's just been a whirlwind. Like things just went so fast. Yeah. And so what is the next lot. stage? You did a video and now now what do you have to do next? Oh, so I I'm, I signed an NDA, so I'm not allowed to talk oh, about it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I got the exact it. Exactly. But there were several steps after that. That's cool. That's really yes. cool. Then. And so... Well, so I'll um, back and tell us later. <laughs> yeah. And, yes, and really, Yeah, please do. And then sign us up because I would love to do that too. I'm just saying. Yeah. I, you know, I'm very I mean, fond of space. <laughs> here's the thing, you know, like, I really hope that I'm chosen. I know that there's still a very, you know, it's a long shot. It's a moonshot still. But at the same time, I do an application in with NASA for astronaut program where I can actually perform research in space. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, even if this doesn't work out, because this really is a lottery ticket, right? Like, You're right, yeah. right. Mill- millions of people applied. It's right. like a space really Willy Wonka. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. It yeah. literally is like a yes. space Willy Wonka. That's great. And I hate to say this, but everything that I've gotten, I've really had to work hard for. That I never get stuff like this. So, like, right, right. <laughs> so I'm not really, I'm not, I'm trying not to get my hopes up. Yeah, and I hear you. I hear you. And we you know it's true. If, if you're going to University of Florida three times and they're rejecting you, yeah, you have had to work hard. And that's, yeah. that's <laughs> you know, well, I mean, Yeah. I mean, here's the thing. When I graduated undergrad, the grad school program was, I think, top, top four. And you had to have a 3.75. And they told me that I couldn't do the five-year program in three years. And I insisted on doing it. Right. Uh, right. But I didn't have the 3.75. Right. Right. So they were like, go work first. And then I worked first. (laughs) Right. So that that was two times. And then during my PhD, my first professor, which if you ever want to do a podcast about grad school, I have so We'd much advice. Yeah, yeah. So much advice. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, so it's, of course, now all the old professors left University of Florida, they retired and mm-hmm. they got all new professors. So now my department is ranked like 12th. I probably could have got in. But yeah. Right, right. <laughs> it's better that when I graduated, they were number three. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, and then you left in the downhill. Yeah, it makes sense. Right, I mean, yeah, it's yeah. totally me. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Um, but yeah, you know, we've, we've talked about a few of the other things you've done, you know, like, um, (laughs) you worked with Mythbusters and Marvel and how did you get to manage to work on all these really cool things? Whether you say they're cool or not, they are cool. So they are. I guess sometimes I do get lucky. Um, 
So let's go back on my previous statement. Uh, no, Mythbusters found the video that I did about my dissertation, my first yeah. video ever. That's what they saw and they let oh, me wow. on. But, you know, to be fair, that was my like fourth event, like attempt with Discovery. I had right. always been working with them on developing my own show before that. That never pans out. I mean, I've been through that process like 70 times. Right. Side note, if you want to do TV, do not look at it as the end game. Be right. the best at your career, whatever you're doing, be the best at it and, you know, do some TV. Just, right. it's a hobby. It's not a career. Right. Um, but yeah, so Mythbusters took me on from there. And then from there, the Marvel Agent of Girl thing happened. So Agent right. of Girl, it, Girl is geniuses in research labs. And so what mission or the end sorry there's a show i'm on called mission unstoppable but this is the unstoppable wasp Wasp. right right (laughs) not stopping so the unstoppable wasp was really cool because it brought in real scientists with every issue and i was lucky enough to just be one of those scientists that they brought in for an issue yeah um but from there a comic writer contacted me and another girl from mythbusters and we started our own comic called seekers of science that's so cool. Man, Laura, what are we doing? What are we doing doing a podcast? Can we, can we get a We're doing podcast? a podcast. Yeah, That's right. what you're doing. <laughs> oh, she's got well, it. We've talked about this, Nick. It's going to evolve into something else. There you go. There you go. So um, as Tracy seems like you just keep going and something else like your mission to, to circle the moon just might lay into something else instead of that actual thing. You're exactly right. It mm-hmm. might. Like being on this podcast. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's it. You're going to be on this yeah. podcast. No, that's exactly right. Then, 100%. Woo! Yeah. To the moon. Yeah. 100% <laughs> the moon I agree with that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's awesome. But, so you have to do a lot of public speaking, too, and being in front of camera and stuff. Do you enjoy public speaking? Have you had to learn to do that? Or are you just kind of natural at it? I got to be honest. Every single time I speak, I hyperventilate first. Yeah. It's um like the whole breathing thing before really does help. but. Apparently, my will for nerves just like combats it every time. Uh, <laughs> and so like you can hear you can hear that I can't breathe in the beginning and it almost sounds like I'm going to cry and then I'm fine. After <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but um, yeah. but it's crazy because I've done over 350 talks now. Wow. And, and it started when I was doing the same talk every time. I would mm-hmm. still get nervous because it was a new audience. But right. eventually it started being fine. I'm like, oh, I've beaten my fears. The minute I switched up my topic, right, yeah. right, back, <laughs> right back. Or, you know, during quarantine, I didn't do it as much or just over yeah. a video. Yeah. So it's tomorrow is my first. I was on a panel, which was my first in person, but that doesn't really count because there's a bunch of people up there and they just ask you specific questions. Tomorrow is my first talk. Uh, sorry. July. What, what month are we in? August. <laughs> August. <laughs> it's August. August 8th. 2021 was my first <laughs> live talk and how I do on that. We don't know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> awesome. You, you nail it. I know. Like, <laughs> you nailed it. It was amazing. Yeah, yeah. It was amazing. It was, it was so amazing. great. Yeah. It was, it was, but tomorrow I'm trying a totally new thing. I was on a uh, natural shark fest this year about anomaly shark bites in uh, mm. off the east coast of florida and i actually found out why they happen like science doesn't work like this what so yeah yeah it was crazy like the data was so this doesn't happen yeah this yeah, doesn't yeah. happen so hurricane irma the same event that started the florida red tide boom the two-year florida red tide boom yeah yeah also called it caused an upwelling event on the east coast which brought nutrients to the surface and that photosynthesis occurred the production just spiked. So yeah, we yeah. had a lot of those producers that bring in bait fish. And the bait fish brought in sharks. That's that's yeah. what my hypothesis is, at least. But the, the, those data were pretty clear. But that's I'm really so excited cool. to talk about that. That's incredible. And then, yeah. And then that'll lead into Red Tide, which I know how to talk about. So Right. Yeah. But yeah, you know, that's really cool. I love when that when science really plays out. That's really, really neat. And uh, yeah, and rare. 99% of the time in science, you, <laughs> you lose. 
Yes, um, but, <laughs> you know, if you wanted to play a video game that you knew how to pass every single day, you can win every single day. You take on a transactional job. But with science, it's like uh, you're on a new board, new game every single day. Mm-hmm. And you're going to lose a lot. But 1% of the time, you can change the world. So that's what we do it for. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Playing. One percent of the time, you can change the world. That's the. I thought the tagline was going to be "space money for Earth problems," but maybe it's that. I love that. <laughs> space money for Earth problems. I love it. Um, so, one of the things I wanted to ask you about too is, you know, we all have moments where we put our foot in our mouths, or we, you know, and it's scarier when it's public speaking. So, like I remember, I was teaching, and I once asked a room full of college students if they've ever had Coke up their nose, and what I meant was Coca Cola, but that's not how they took it, right? And so I am. <laughs> mortified the seconds after the words come out of my mouth. I'm like, no, 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 I meant, I meant the drink, the drink. <laughs> Have you ever you had a moment? like the carbonation. Right, yeah, yeah. And it burns. You're like, ah, you know, this is, you know, because there's an opening that, you know, you know I was trying to say your nose and your mouth are connected. And so <laughs> that's not how it came out. Have you ever had a moment like that where you said something you, you wish you All could take time. back? All the time. All the time. And the thing is, then I laugh at my own jokes and no one else does. Right, right. <laughs> Um, if you, if you teach, yeah, if you teach, you probably had them all the time. Like I said, shut up to a kid. They were like, Hey, did you know that Venus, blah, blah, blah. I was like, no way. Shut up. (laughs) And they were like, "Ah, I was like, all right, I need to find another way to make money through grad school. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Yep. That's hilarious. Oh, that's great. But yeah, with, uh, with, you know, what's more serious is when, we communicate science at the time. Okay, science mm-hmm. is always evolving. Right. So we communicate the science that we know to be true. And then that science evolves. Yeah. And they're like, well, you said this last time. And I'm like, well, we learned more. But they were like, mm-hmm. no, someone's paying you. <laughs> oh, come on. Yeah, I, it's been rough. It's yeah. been like communicating. I, I feel for all of those immunologists through covid I know. Uh, that tried to communicate science because it is in Fauci. Oh my gosh. I know. Oh my gosh. I mean, the mask thing, I went on Weather Channel and they, they asked me about masks and I showed them a particle size distribution and, yeah. the, part, and the openings of different masks. And I'm like, so these masks really won't, they're not going to get these, you know, they're not going to get most of them. It's going to help a little, but for right. the majority, and apparently that helping a little, because now we know that the concentration of the virus needs to be a certain amount for you to be infected, which is more associated with those bigger particles. So the masks have been working. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's like, but we didn't know that then. Right. All we exactly. knew is the science that we had. And so when science evolves, people have a hard time understanding that because they haven't been through it. And that's why community science and citizen science is so important, getting people on the ground with the scientists to understand that evolution. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, we know what we know until we know better. And um, and like, uh, it's funny because this one for me is, okay, this is historically what's happened, right? But this has never happened before. What's happening right now has never happened before. And, uh, you know, you can look at the Spanish flu, but this is not the Spanish flu. This is a different thing. So yeah. I think you're totally right. It's really hard for people to see that because they just see the, the change from one thing to another. They don't see the steps in between. Right. And the amount of science that we did in a year was mind-blowing. Incredible. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. You have done so much and you have persisted throughout. Do you have a mentor or someone that you want to shout out or, or someone who gave, has been giving you advice and helping you get to where you are? That's it. Thank you for letting me do that. Yeah. So Dr. Chaddick, Paul Chaddick was the one that got me into University of Florida. Dr. David Mazik was the one that told me I couldn't graduate in three years, which I did. Um, and then he got me into grad school. He has been my, he was on all my committees. He's been such a support and such like when I, when my funding ran out, he got me a position. Like he's just an amazing person, Dr. David Mazik from the University of Florida. And then you know, I think that my journey has been very different. You know, I didn't really have an advisor through my PhD. I was pretty much on my own. A lot of oh, wow. things happen. Yeah. I mean, my professor, he was such a brilliant person, such an amazing person, but he was let go from the university. Oh. Uh, yeah. So he really wasn't there, which yeah. was fine because I knew what I was doing. I was actually in the field 
working before I came back for grad school. But so I wish I had a really long list of mentors, but those two I will always remember. And Dr. Batone, Gabrielle Batone, who got me my first science job. Awesome. Yeah. And it's those people that really influences, they stick with you, you, whether it's one or 20. I'm glad you have them and I'm glad we could hear who they are on the show. And so I know. Yeah, yeah. And we're, we're wrapping up here. We're, we're coming to the end. I want to thank you again so much for being here. It's so awesome. We hope you come back and, and spend some more time with us once you're a famous astronaut. <laughs> and, uh, you know, maybe show us some moon rocks or something. I don't know. I don't know. We'll work it out. We'll figure it out as we go. But um, is there anything else you want to mention before we let you go? No, I think that we covered a lot more than I've ever covered in a podcast before. So. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So, all right, before we get you out, um, where can people find you? My handle on pretty much all social media is at Inspector Planet. And yeah, inspectorplanet.com. But you can sign up to be on our team to be part of Inspector Planet, whether you're an expert or a community member anywhere in the world. So please, please join join our mission. Yeah. Super and cool. yeah, for those of you that are fans of the show, Captain Planet, there's also a nice, nice tie in theme, I think, to the website. So it's a, uh, Really cool. I do hope you guys check it out. That's inspectorplanet.com. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, correct. .com. There we go. And so thank you so much, Tracy, for being on and good luck with all your future endeavors. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much. All right. That's our show. Thank you, Tracy, so much for joining us today. Nick, I think yeah. um, I'm not doing enough stuff. <laughs> I know that it feels yeah. like I am, but I'm not. Yeah. <laughs> we got we to gotta stop having so, so many wonderful people on because they always make us look bad. That's all I can think of when I... It's <laughs> so much she's doing. It's great. Yeah, super cool. So anyway, thanks for joining us today. Please be sure to check us out each and every Friday. And don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review. Bye. See you, everybody.